morning, what we're going to be addressing uh, is a, a very overlooked disease. And it is a disease that infects uh, probably everyone in the room. I'll include myself for sure. Uh, it carries a, a devastating impact on our life. And uh, it drives a lot of foolish decisions. This disease drives us to take money that we shouldn't take, to, uh, to dating people that we shouldn't date. This disease drives us to buy things we should never buy, to, uh, to do drugs that we should never do. And this disease, disease drives us to a lifelong regret. In fact, uh, there will be a few of you as we go through the, the message today that are older who will say, yeah, yeah, I look back on my life and I... I regret the majority of it. Marriages implode. Families have been abandoned. Wallets have been emptied. Bank accounts have been drained. Credit cards and credit scores ruined. In fact, this disease uh, not only drives our foolish decisions and leads to our lifelong regret, but it also mars our reputation. And if you struggle from this soul disease, I mean, people will actually view you, and they may not say it all the time, but they will view you as, as flighty or as flaky or as an indecisive person or an anxious or worried individual. That's what this particular soul disease does. This disease steals our ability to love. Uh, it makes it hard to be a joyful person. It makes it hard to be a, a peaceful person. It makes it hard to be a patient person, a consistent person, or a self-controlled person. This disease steals from our ability to, to showcase true love. And if that's you this morning where you say, yeah, I'm not very joyful, I'm not very peaceful, I'm not very patient, I'm not very consistent, I certainly am not a very self-controlled individual, then that would probably be because you suffer from this disease. In fact, the next two months, <laughs> November and December, the entire world system is going to be pressing like, like, like an airborne pathogen, this particular disease upon all of us. And you're going to start feeling it. I mean, I guarantee in the next couple of weeks, you're going to start feeling the pressure from the world. The advertisements, the billboards across the news feed as you scroll, every time you click on a commercial, you're going to be feeling the pressure of the pathogen of this disease trying to take and suck away your peace. Uh, and this particular disease is slowly robbing your entire life of lasting joy. Of course, I'm talking about the disease this morning of discontent the disease of discontentment. If you have your Bibles, open it with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 7. And uh, let's begin a little bit of a, a study here, just on a paragraph. And you'll see, if you remember, in 1 Corinthians 7 from last week, we're right in the middle of a discussion by Paul on, on family relationship. And what he seems to be doing here in verses 17 to 24 is kind of pausing and uh, pulling out a little bit and, and saying, you know, let me give you the heart of this whole thing. You know, if you struggle with being single, <laughs> and some of you go, I, I struggle with being single. Some of you struggle with being married. Some of you struggle because you were divorced or, or widowed. Some of you struggle because you've got a little house or no house. Some of you struggle because you have a big house. Some of you struggle because you live in... Um, Orange County, and some of you feel you struggle because you live in Los Angeles. Paul basically is pulling out and he's looking at the Corinthians who struggled with their social situation, and he says, I want to I wanna help you. I want to help you. You remember that what they've been asking? They've been asking, you know, things like, Well, I got saved. Should I just leave my wife? She's not a Christian, so why do I want to stay married to her? They've been asking things like, Well, if I do stay married, should we just never, ever have romance ever again? Just go celibate in the marriage. Is it better to maybe just be a, a monk and go live in a cave somewhere instead of staying in Corinth around all the pagan sin? And so Paul steps in here this morning, and he wants to help them with, with an answer. They're asking, should I change? 
Should I uproot my home? Should I leave my city? Should I restart my life, my relationships? And Paul's simple answer, you ready, is going to be, no, 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 no. I want you to change as little as possible. I want you to be content where you are. Wherever you're planted, I want you to bloom. Christians aren't to be success seekers. We're not frantic for change. We don't do wanderlust where we, we just kind of take off around the world trying to fill ourselves with experiences and adventure to find meaning. He says, I want you to be content in the social sphere in which you've been called. And so if you have your Bible there in 1 Corinthians 7, let's go ahead and just look at the principle which he lays down in verse 17. And if you're a note taker, you can go ahead and just, I'll put these on the screen. You could jot this down. Here's the big principle for the whole paragraph. He says, I want you to be content in the condition that you're called. I want you to be satisfied in the situation that the Lord has, um, has called you, you from. In fact, look at verse 17. If you have a pen, just hold on to it. And we can look at each one of the words here. And we can drill this truth down into our soul. He says, only... Remember, he's talking about single and married and widowed and divorced and all the challenges they're facing in the pagan city of Corinth. And he says, now, now, let me zero in, give you the heart of this whole thing. That's what that little word only means. Only. As the Lord has assigned. There's your first key word. If you've got a pen, underline that. And in the margin, just kind of jump up there and, and you could write the, the big theological word Providence. As the Lord has assigned, meaning God is in charge of all things, he has, He's known everything in your life, He's got a plan for your life, He's stewarding your life, He's not surprised by your life, everything in your life has been assigned by Him. So He says, as the Lord has assigned to each one, as God has called, there's your next key word, you could underline that, and in the margin you could put effectually called, meaning He reached in. We heard it in the, in the testimony a moment ago in the baptistry. He reached in and he gave you a new heart and he made you a saint. He made you a son of God. He did that work. And he says, in the situation that he assigned to you, as he reached in and he made you one of his children, and then here's the imperative command. Ready? It's three times in this paragraph. In this manner, meaning in this situation, in this social sphere, here's the imperative, let him walk. Meaning, let him stay. That's where he should be living. That's where he should be serving. That's where his life should be building. And then it's universal. Look at that final sentence. And thus I direct in all of the churches. So it's a pretty basic command. As the Lord has providentially and powerfully selected you and called you unto himself, in that situation, he says, I want you, generally speaking, to stay put. And that's a universal command for all the churches. So hopefully you can already sense how he is attacking the disease of discontent. You know, he knows what's bound to happen, and he knows what's happening in Corinth. Is here you have these people and there's such a radical change of their soul that their natural question is, well, should there just be a radical change of my social situation? Maybe it's better to just go be a monk and live in a cave. So, so, so honey, I love you. It's great, but I'm saved. Sayonara. Maybe it's better to just go find a, a bunch of conservatives somewhere and, and we, can, we can build a town outside of Corinth and we can start over. Maybe it's better to, to lead a political revolt with the moral majority and overthrow Rome. Paul says, slow down. He says, slow down. And this stuff happens all the time, right? You hear people say things like, well, I'll really be a solid Christian if I can just live and then fill in the blank. I mean, my family and I, we're really going to be fired up for the Lord if we can just get to and then fill in the city, the town, or the state. My family and I, I mean, we're really going to live moral lives if we can just live or if we can just have fill in the blank. Paul says, slow down on that. Slow down on that. And he knows that's going to require some explanation for the reader and for us. And so he, he provides two case studies here. Uh, the first one's in verse 18. And if you're taking notes, you know, number one was be content in the condition you're called. 
Number two, he's going to start with their, their cultural or ethnic heritage. And he, if you want to write this one down, number two, he says, be content in the background, the background from which you're called. You could call it the, the heritage or the culture. See verse 18. He says, was any man called already circumcised? Now, don't freak out there, okay? We'll talk about it. I'll explain this in a second. Was any man called already circumcised? Let him not become uncircumcised. Has anyone been called in on circumcision? Well, let him then not have to go and be circumcised. Circumcision is nothing, and uncircumcision is nothing. But what matters is what? Keeping the commandments of who? What's your Bible say? Commandments of God. And then here's the imperative. Again, verse 20. Let each man remain in that condition in which he was called. Now, now I know and for us, if you haven't been around church long, you, you, you know, the idea of a preacher getting up and reading something about circumcision can freak us out a little bit. Because you know, for us, it's a general thing. It's a physical deal. It's a medical deal. It's part of being born in America. All that stuff happens, most goes commonly. But we need to go back a few thousand years and kind of understand what he's saying here. Uh, you know, the, the way it would have worked is you would have had a group of, uh, let's say, uh, thousands of years ago, the entire world of Gentiles or pagans, you know, go all the way back to Abraham's time, they, they were uncircumcised, okay? And if you don't know what that is, ask mom and dad later and don't Google it, just ask mom and dad or come find me, okay? And so everyone was uncircumcised. And then you have God step in and he grabs Abraham and he says, you're going to be a nation unto me. And I'm going to give you a right or a practice, an external one of circumcision to be an indicator to the world and to you and to your people that you're called out and set apart, you're one of mine. So by the time you get to the first century, you've got this massive, you ready for it, cultural divide between all the uncircumcised people of the world, it's a very obvious thing, when you're in gymnasiums wrestling naked, you know who's what, and then the Jewish people who were the circumcised. So much so that you would have people fake it. And it sounds creepy to think about, but Josephus tells us sometimes Greeks, you know, would, would, would go and be circumcised to look like a Jew, and other times Jews would have surgeries and sew things on in order to look like a, like a Gentile. It was a, it was a big deal. Uh, but all of it was a cultural thing. And what he's saying here is that were, were you called as a Jew? Doesn't matter anymore. Were, were you called to God as a, as, a, as a pagan Gentile, an outsider? It doesn't matter anymore. He's talking about your heritage and your cultural background. Uh, and there's a couple things to point out there. Number one would just be it's an obvious clarification on Christian living. I mean, look at verse 19. Read it with me again. What matters, read it again, he says, was any man already circumcised, let him not be uncircumcised? Has anyone been uncircumcised or a Greek or a Roman, let him not become a Jew? Circumcision is nothing and uncircumcision is nothing. Now read it again, but what matters is the keeping of the what? See, that's a clarification, an implicit clarification here that when the, the key to being a Christian is living for Christ. It's not where you come from. And that leads to the main point of this particular section. Christian living has zero to do with your cultural heritage. It has zero to do with it. I mean, that's what he says there in verse 19. Just one more time, look at it. Circumcision is nothing. Being a Jew is nothing. And, and being a Roman is nothing. <laughs> and, and let's make sure we're clear. 2,000 years ago, when Paul's writing this, these are fighting words. He would have been canceled for this. See, some of you go, no, no, that didn't make any sense. It doesn't seem like a very big deal, you know? Well, no, just take 2,000 years, fast forward, and put Paul here in America today with the modern woke world. And I want you to try to think about what he's saying. You think about it. Nowadays, what do you, you, I saw the pride flag again yesterday. They're up to like 22 colors. Have you seen this? It's like 22 colors now. And they're going all different directions because they can't even fit them on there. And now they've got like a, what is it, a unicorn in the middle of the thing? Because what does the world teach? Every individual color, you, you need to actually boast in your color. So, so black is beautiful. And brown is best. And yellow is, you know, awesome. Right? Take Paul now and transfer him 2,000 years and put him and give him a microphone down in, you know, up in, uh, in Sacramento next to Newsom. 
Okay. And he walks up, he's a short guy with bald hair, and he has the microphone, tap, 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 and they're ready to turn off the mic. And here's what he says. He says, no, actually, um, whiteness is nothing, blackness is nothing, brownness is nothing, yellowness is nothing, but living according to the glory, and for the glory of God is everything. Thank you very much. And then he walks away. Now question, how's that go over? You think people are going to cheer? That's why he got beat up so much. Now hopefully you can see why that is so important, right? If everyone that ever got saved tried to, to, to culturally homogenize, you know, <laughs> tried to all become like each other, then the church would eventually shrivel up and die. I mean, what that would mean is like there's a bunch of robots and then we get saved and we look over and we go, oh, that's what the Christians look like. And so we run over and we get in the same village in the same town, we put on the same clothes and we celebrate all the same pastimes. Well, what eventually happens to Christianity? Eventually it, it, it dies. It dies. I mean, that's what the Shakers were. Anybody remember the Shakers? You ever heard of them? 200 years ago was this little kind of cult group that was a, a holy, rolling, charismatic group that they got in all their little towns around the country and they would just look for the rapture so they'd kill the electricity and just wait for Jesus to come back. You know how many Shakers there, there are today? They had 18 towns in the 1800s. Can you guess how many there are today? You know, the kids, teens would leave, and then someone would die, and the teens would leave, and someone would die. There's one town left called Sabbath Day Village in Maine, and there's three of them. There's three. Christ doesn't want robots. He doesn't want Terminators or, or, or clones. He doesn't want the lollipop kids from Wizard of Oz. Remember those creepy little guys? That's not what he wants. He placed his strategic presence of his bride in every nation, in every tongue, and in every tribe, and every nook and cranny of the world for true diversity. So that no matter where you go across the world, what are you going to find? You're going to find Christians. And what Paul is saying is, listen, when you get saved, don't rush to, over to a conservative camp and hide. He says, stay where you are and bloom where you're planted because God has a plan for your life. He's going to use your background. And then he moves on, look at this, to number three. He says, be content in the condition, be content in the background, number three. And even be content, you ready for this one? In the budget from which you've been called. Jump down to verse 21. He says, were you called while a slave? Now, now, now that word can scare us because we remember American slavery, which was horrific. But understand that you know, slavery is ubiquitous across the history of mankind. There's always going to be a, a group of people that try to use and, and keep others under bondage. And Paul's not giving a treatise right here and advocating for slavery. He's just illustrating from slavery because it was a reality. But in the first century, slavery by and large was a lot more gracious uh, than, than typically what we see in, in modern slavery. Uh, a lot of these particular slaves were, were cultured and they were doctors and they were they were teachers and they were cared for. It was often better to be a slave than to be an impoverished individual who couldn't make ends meet. But it was still a tough life. It was the bottom and quote of the totem pole. It would be like today, you know, if you said, man, I struggle because I'm part of a working class or I'm, in, I'm a day laborer or I'm making minimum wage and I, I just, I feel like it's a menial job. That's the illustration that Paul's giving. And look at what he says there in verse 21. He says, were you called to Christ while working this, this menial role? Where you feel like you're kind of at the bottom of the socioeconomic engine? Then look at the next phrase. This is remarkable. He says, don't worry about it. He says, but if you're able also to become free, do that. Meaning, if you have some upward mobility and you can make a little more money, that's good. But he says, don't worry about it. Don't spend all your time harping and hemming and hawing on the fact that you're, 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 that you're there in that economic blue-collar spectrum. He says, don't worry about it. 
Don't let that beat you down. Don't let that be the thing that keeps you up at night. Don't let that make you anxious. Don't worry about it. And then he gives the reason in verse 22. For he who was called in the Lord while a slave, so you got saved while you were in that menial job, is the Lord's freedman. In the Lord's eyes, you're a son or a daughter. You've already been given an inheritance in heaven. And then he flips it around. Look at verse 22. Likewise, he who was called while free... This would be the guy who's in the corner office, he's doing well, he's got a portfolio, and at least it was doing well to the last month, and he was doing well. He was called while free, finish it with me, is Christ what? You see what he's doing here? He's switching it around. If you have a tough job, you need to remember that in heaven, you're an heir. If you've got a great job and you're doing well, you need to remember that in heaven, you're a what? You're a slave. You work for Christ. See in verse 23, you both were bought with a price, so neither one of you need to focus on being slaves of men. And then here's the command again in verse 24. Brethren, let each man remain with God in that condition in which he was called. Don't be frantic. Don't don't do the ladder climbing. Don't don't, don't be amassing luxury. Don't focus all your energy on getting ahead on on, on this planet. Now, if you got a pen, just jump down there real quick and try to catch how he shows two sides of the same coin. And this is gonna bless, this is gonna bless. All of you, regardless of where you're at on the socioeconomic spectrum. First, he says, if you have a menial role, don't despair. So so right now, don't raise your hands, please. But but if you go, you know what? I I feel like I'm making under a certain amount of money a year, and I'm kind of in a blue-collar category, and I'm or I'm making minimum wage, and I'm I'm even though Newsom bumped us up at Chick-fil-A, it's still not going well. You know, you're 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 down there. And you, you, you kind of feel intimidated or insecure or anxious about that? Look again at verse 21. He says, if you're called while a slave, don't worry. See, even if you're in bondage on earth, it's tough on earth, you're free for eternity. Christ already promised you earth and heaven and the kingdom, so don't let slavery make you anxious. Use the position that you're in. And now there may be a few of you on the other side, and you're going, well, man, I'm doing well. I mean, I'm rolling. If you all only knew how well I played the market, man, they tell me to buy low. I bought low and I went high. And you're doing well. Draw your eyes. Let your eyes drop down to verse 22. He flips it and says, if you've an esteemed role, don't be prideful. See verse 22? He who was called while free is still Christ what? Yeah. You're still a slave to Christ. See, the guy in bondage may forget his freedom, but the guy in freedom may forget his enslavement. And he says, don't do that. Don't go live in your will. Don't forget who you really are. Live for the will of God. I love what John Piper says. He says, quote, gospel is the antidote for despair in the menial jobs and the antidote for pride in the esteemed ones, end quote. So no matter where you are on the spectrum, the gospel is the one that levels the playing field and it keeps us level-headed and it keeps us humble. Let me show you something real quick, if you'd be willing. Would you turn with me just one verse or two verses back to Philippians chapter 4? This is important. I want you to see this because the Apostle Paul modeled it so well. Uh, It wasn't just that he was telling the Corinthians to do it. He was actually a guy who lived out contentment. And you remember the story. Here he is. He's writing these letters to, uh, to Philippi, and he's in bondage. He's in a jail cell, and he's chained to a, a Roman brute. Imagine what that was like. You got a guy, he's mocking you, making fun of you. They're changing shifts, and if you got a little rascally, he could knock you upside the head. There was nothing you could do. Imagine being tethered, eight-foot chained to a Roman centurion and trying to live your life. And yet he has the ability to write to Philippi. And look what he says in Philippians 4.11. Now, all you are going to know the verse, okay? So just picture, it's the verse you see on a screensaver, the verse you see on the bumper sticker, the verse you see on somebody's arm. Everyone tattoos it on their arm for some reason. You know, they think this is the verse that means you can pummel someone in the UFC octagon and all these things, right? That God's going to give you a million bucks. Here we go. Philippians 4.11. Look at it. Paul says, I have learned. Now stop there. Just think about that. The Apostle Paul says, I have had to learn. 
Contentment doesn't come naturally. It's something that he had to to learn. Keep reading. I have learned to be content. I've learned to be satisfied. I've learned to be okay. And then key, in whatever circumstances I am. I mean, when I'm in good circumstances or when I'm chained to a brute over here, I have learned to be satisfied. Verse 12, I know how to get along with humble means when I I barely have enough food to eat and how to live in prosperity when my bank account seems to be growing from tent making. I have learned the secret of being filled and of going hungry, both of having abundance and suffering need. Notice how this is in the context of economy, the context of his lifestyle. And then there's the famous verse in verse 13, how did I do this? I can do all things through him who, what? Who strengthens me. See, that verse doesn't mean you're going to go pummel some guy in the octagon. That doesn't mean God's going to give you a new car. That verse means that when things are going really good, you're going to be content if you have Christ and you focus on Christ. And when things are going really, really tough, you're going to be content because you focus on Christ. But you're not doing this all the time. You're even keel because you have who? Because you have Christ. Now, here's where the rubber meets the road, and this starts to cut really close to the heart. You ready? How you doing? Are you content? Anybody say every day this week you were just, I mean, you were just locked in, perfectly content every single moment, no ups, no downs. Your, your wife, you know, came to you, Daniela and Michael, and she was, you know, having a moment, and Michael said, it is okay, young one. It is okay. I can do all things, and so can you, through Christ, who strengthens us. Come on, Orange County families. How you doing? You feel like you're pretty even keel, or you struggle a little bit? Am I the only one? No. Okay, good. Good. I feel better now. Anthony, you're a pretty even keel guy, right? Your kids agree? Noah, do you know? Okay. You guys remember the sermon that I gave a few weeks ago about the fact that we all are sheep? You remember that? Okay. See, what happens is we're like lambs and we're prone to wander. So God gives us a, a little field and uh, we like it for about two minutes. You remember when you got a new house or a new apartment and it was like the first 24 hours, you're just laying there in bed going, well, you, you, you forgot about the mortgage and you're just laying there in bed and you're going, and you're going, oh, I'm a homeowner or whatever it is. Or you got a new apartment, you know, and it's the nice one and you got a good rate. Or some of you got a new girlfriend or boyfriend or that moment you got married and you're on the honeymoon and you're like, I'm married. And you're looking at your ring and you're like, this is awesome. And then how long did that feeling of euphoria last? Was it two minutes? See, because we're sheep, and God gives us a little pasture over here with our grass, and we look at it, and we go, oh, this is really nice, until what? We look through the fence, and we see our friends, and we see what God gave them, and before we know it, we're going, "Ah," and we're looking over into their field. Is that not true? Forgetting that what? What's our friend doing? Looking through the fence, staring at our grass, going, "Ah," and back and forth it goes throughout our entire life. I mean, in this church right now, sitting like literally next to each other, there's going to be the young mom or the dad, and they're, they're, they're like knee-deep in Lego blocks, and they're just overwhelmed all the time, and they're like, oh, Lord, we've got three under three, and our whole life is Lego blocks, and then they scroll through Instagram, and then they see someone else in the church, and they're off at Santa Barbara and jet-setting over to Europe, and they're like, oh, if I could only be there. Not knowing that that same couple sitting right next to you is actually the one that's crying themselves to sleep at night because the woman hasn't been blessed with a child and she desperately wants to be what? You, knee deep in Lego blocks. Exact same church, exact same neighborhood. There's a guy, he just got his brand new job. He's working nine to five. He's got money coming in. But he's every night coming home and he's, he's lonely and he's tired of having a cat. He wants a wife. Not a cat, they're demons. He wants a, he's a dog, and he, he, he wants a wife. Sorry, Grace, I'm going to hear about that. Okay, I'll hear about that later. And not knowing that just literally next door, 
There's a man who got in a fight with his wife and he's rolling over and giving her the cold shoulder and what's going through his mind is should I have ever tied the knot because I'm no longer able to chase the career the way that, the way that I used to. All the time, we're looking at the pasture next to us and we're never satisfied with the one that we're in. And then what does the devil do? You know what he does? What does he do? Where does he stand? He stands right on the fence post and what does he do? Hey, little sheepy. Did you happen to, to, to see all the negatives in your pasture? Oh. Well, hey, little sheepy, look at all the positives in their pasture. Oh. And if you'll just keep trying to go to the next hill, I promise you, little sheepy, there's more out there over the next rise. I promise that there's going to be happiness there. And so what do we do? We paw at the fence trying to get through, look into the next field and the next field and the next field and the next field. Friends, is there ever a there there? Yes or no? Have you ever found it? And we go through our entire life discontent. Never having lived. Never having joy. Never having peace or patience. Never serving. God says move less and grow more. No matter your lot, no matter your station, serve Christ. Because life isn't defined by your circumstances, but by who you are in them. If you're unfaithful, it has zero to do with where you are and 100% to do with who you are. I mean, contentment is a rare thing. It's a rare thing. When's the last time you saw a truly content person? If you met one, I'll tell you, they've got gray hair. Because in the next generation, they're, they're, they're like an extinct animal. You remember those old National Geographics, right? The guy's like, the photographer sat in the bush. And then all of a sudden, the red heron came flying through, long thought to be extinct, and there she was. That's the way it is with contentment anymore. When you find somebody who's truly even keel through the highs and the lows. It's almost like you just want to walk and be around them all the time because the way that their joy begins to infuse your own, it's rare. I remember my poppy, he was 90. Before he died, he was 93, and he'd come visit. He'd sit there slumped over in the chair with his leg crossed, and I was a young man in ministry, and I had all these questions. Poppy, what's going on with the world? Don't you see who's getting elected? Oh, the church is suffering, you know. And I, Poppy, what should we do? Oh, well, you know. No, I don't know, Poppy. Tell me, what should I do? Oh, you know, Poppy. I'll never forget, he'd smack his little, his little, little knee, legs crossed. Well... Pretty sure the Bible has a lot to say about patience, you know. Oh, that's it? You know. <laughs> Born in the Great Depression, struggled through that as a kid, World War II, civil rights, Vietnam. Korea, Cold War. Young man, relax and trust God. It's hard, isn't it? It's a hard lesson. I'm going to put a few things on the uh, screen here for you. It's a hard lesson. It's a hard lesson. Contentment's a hard lesson to learn. Third of the angels never learned it. Adam and Eve in their innocence never learned it. I'd say very few modern Christians ever learn it. But friends, number two, if you want to write this down, it's a universal lesson. Don't think that if you have money, you suddenly will become content. Rich men are sad they don't have more money. Poor men are sad they don't have enough money. But nobody ever escapes. It's a hard lesson, a universal lesson, and it's a divine lesson. 
You can't get there by trying. You can't acquire contentment. You have to get on your knees. And it's got to be an infusion of the Holy Spirit where he plants the tree of life in your heart and that fruit begins to burst out, which leading number four, it is a habitual lesson. It's not going to appear now and then like a star in the night. It's going to be the sun that rises on your life every single morning. I mean, don't, don't get me now. Let me be clear on this. Don't, don't say, oh, I was content today. And then explode in the evening to your wife. Contentment is something that is ongoing. It's not a here and there thing. That's emotions. That's riding the high of a good day. Contentment is an ongoing, habitual thing. It's all based, number one, in God's precept, his law. Hebrews 13.5 says it's a duty. The same God that ordered we believe orders we trust him. And it's all wired ultimately, lastly, in God's plan. Whatever our lot God has taught me to say, it is well, it is well with my soul because he decreed it from eternity past. I mean, that's the whole point of Matthew 10.30 when Jesus says, hey, the Father knows when even one of those little sparrows falls to the ground. And then he goes on and he says, even all the hairs of your head are numbered. If God cares about a little sparrow, he knows exactly what's happening in your life so you can trust him. But you know what happens, friends, is the flesh always rises up because you can walk away from church. And I know some of you will do it today. You'll walk away from church and you'll go, oh, I know that's true in my mind. I'm so excited. I want to be content. But then the flesh is going to rise up when you get in that car. And by the time you turn left or right out of the parking lot, you're going to start to hear the cries from the flesh. God, how can I trust you? We lost a child. God, how can I trust you? I've been through financial loss. God, how can I trust you? We can't have babies. Or my family causes me such grief. And my friends have betrayed me. And and God, how can I trust you? My, My dad abused me. How can I trust you, God? I've never been honored or I've suffered for the truth or, or God, the wicked are elected. Don't you see what's happening in the hallowed halls of, of government? God, the times are evil. The church suffers. Our parents are splitting up. My lack of talent, oh God. Look at me. My sin distresses me. Oh God, I understand. They all need to be content, but I'm different. So I have the right to go through my life not trusting you and not believing in you and not trusting that the plan you have for me is right. They need to learn to contend me, but not me, God. I have the right to be unhappy. And the flesh is going to set in and it's going to press and it's going to push. Paul says, I've learned the secret In abundance, key word, and in suffering. What is it? I can do all things through through Christ who strengthens me. There's no excuses. There's no excuses. It's every day, all the day, all the time, trusting Christ. Let me quickly just give you four steps. If you're here this morning and you're going, you know what, I never thought about myself as a discontent person. I, I'm realizing now that I struggle with this. Young people, old people, doesn't matter. Let me give you just four quick steps to try to work on this, okay, so that you can have joy moving forward with your life, okay? Here we go. Number one, you ready? Repent. Repent. I put them all in ours for you. Repent. Many of you in the room... We're never taught that grumbling is a sin that God absolutely hates. Now listen closely, okay? You ready for this? He killed and destroyed the Israelites multiple times for the sin of grumbling. In fact, in 1 Corinthians 10, you know what he's going to teach us? Three things that God absolutely hates. Idolatry, sexual immorality, and grumbling. Because what it says is, is I don't trust you, God. I don't trust you. He hates it as a sin. You've got to repent. It's time to drop the worldly ambition, the success seeking, the social media, and get on your face and just cry out and say, Lord, I am thankful that you've given me one more breath. 
As Thomas Watson says, it's time to sit in holy silence. As David said, I'm coming mute before you, God. Why did I think that I had the right for another breath, let alone to question who you are? God, I'm sorry, and I'm laying myself out, and I'm just not going to talk for a while. I'm just going to sit here. And I'm just going to put my head down. I'm going to close my eyes, and I'm going to mourn my pride. You've given me life, and you've given me food, and you've given me family, and you've given me a church. You've given me a nation that all those struggling is still the freest in the entire world. God, you've given me heaven. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. And if you repent, number two is you'll begin to rejoice. You'll begin to rejoice. You stop focusing on what you don't have, you'll start praising all that you do and thanking God for your station. He put you here. And the same God that spoke the stars into place has got a handle on your house and the stock market, inflation, and all the rest of it. He's got it locked in. And you'll begin to rejoice. And if you repent and you rejoice, it allows you, number three, to reorient, to reorient your thinking and to read direct your energies and to seek first the kingdom. In fact, finish that verse with me that Jesus, that Jesus gave us. Ready? Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and then what? So you've heard that verse too. Okay? Take that verse and just pin it up somewhere at your house and say, Lord, all my, my investment, all my time, all my energy is going to be seeking first the kingdom of God. You, you told me, you promised me, I'm taking you at your word, you'll handle the rest. I just want to reorient my thinking around evangelism and discipleship groups and ministry and the church and serving you. I want to give everything to you. And then whatever you do with me, I trust you because you promised to care for me. In fact, Thomas Watson says, quote, if you have a love object clutched near your heart, by the way, think about it, do you? Is it your bank account? Is it a house? Is it a spouse? Is it a romantic opportunity with a man or a woman? Anything you clutch. Watson says, if you have a love object clutched near your heart, God will pull away that comfort and then tear a part, a part of your heart out with it. End quote. And he does that. He does that. So repent, rejoice, reorient your thinking, and that will allow, lastly, my favorite one. You ready? Finally, you'll be able to relax. Some of y'all, me too, we just got to relax. We really do. No names, all of us. <laughs> Remember what I said about the sheep? Okay, stop looking at everyone's pasture. Just, I don't know what that means for you. You apply it. Just stop looking at everyone's pasture. Stop being frantic. Corporate climbing, amassing luxury, the wanderlust, the political revolutions, moving here and there, trying to build something on earth. Just stop it all and just enjoy what you have. Just enjoy it. Watson says, quote, the world is a shadow that's receding. It promises more than you'll ever find. It screams change, but it never does. The world is ice that is smooth but melting, an Egyptian pyramid of the greatest kings, outwardly impressive, but inwardly a maze of death, just vanity, vanity, and vanity. Uh, I have a friend who was hanging with an older gentleman, and I won't say his age, because then if you're that age, you'll think I called you old. He was a seasoned saint in his 70s, okay? A seasoned saint. Um, and my friend simply asked him, he said, um, how do you go through life and, and be content? <laughs> and I love it. This guy said, he said, well, son, the problem was that when I was in my teenage years, all I wanted was a gal. And then when I was in my 20s, all I wanted was, uh, was some kids. And then when I was in my 30s, all I wanted was a, a house my 40s, all I wanted was a reputation. In my 50s, all I wanted was uh, to travel. In my 60s, all I wanted was to retire. And now that I'm in my 70s and I'm about to meet Jesus, I'm realizing that he's all 
that I should have ever wanted the entire time. I'm over the hill now. I get that. You climb it and you hit 40. And it's not even like a hill. It's like an elevator. It is like, it just drops. You know what's really, 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 really starting to, 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 to hit me in a deep way now that I'm in the third quarter of my life, friends? Anyone who's older, you'll, you'll feel this too. The world, the flesh, and the devil spent the whole first half of our life doing what? putting carrots out in front of us and carrots out in front of us and we've never actually lived. We've never actually enjoyed God, enjoyed our family. We've, we've constantly been striving. If the disease of discontent ravages your soul, you need to know that God puts you where he puts you, with the people and in this place for a purpose. And you can do all things through what? Through Christ who strengthens you.